This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio! To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell, and if you're just joining us uh, this hour from any of our many affiliates around the world, welcome to the show. The Exxon is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And we come to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, across Europe on Euro Radio TV, and, of course, on the Exxon Broadcast Network and iHeart Radio. My guest this hour, Exxon Nation, is Robert W. Sullivan IV. He is a philosopher, historian jurist, mystic, lay uh, theologian, radio TV personality, writer, lawyer, and best-selling author of the books The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism, which was published in 2012 and republished in 2016, and Cinema Symbolism, a guide to esoteric imagery in in popular movies, which was originally published in 2014 and republished in 2017. His third book, Cinema Symbolism 2, More Esoteric Imagery from Popular Movies, was released this year in 2017. Joining me now is Robert Sullivan. And uh, Rob, welcome to the Exxon. Thank you, Rob, for having me on tonight. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to this evening's show. Thank you. Rob, what, what started you on your path to... Uh, to the esoteric, the the symbolism, Masonic rituals, and so on? It started when I was a child. I was fascinated and, and very interested. I've always have been in things like UFOs, cryptozoology, mm-hmm. Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. I was a huge fan of uh, the old uh, In Search of show. Oh, gosh, yeah. With, yeah, with Leonard Nimoy. I mean, I was a big fan of that. And as I was growing up, it just was an interest of mine. And I, I come from a long line of Maryland Freemasons. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, and a lot of my grandfathers and great-grandfathers were Freemasons. And I, I went to college, and I studied abroad my junior year. I went to Oxford University, and it was over there that I was introduced to this whole idea of the hermetic, what I would call the hermetic tradition, the occult tradition, not necessarily in a negative way, but just its influence on material culture, society, from all different aspects, from a religious standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a you know socio-religious standpoint, um, and to a political uh, standpoint. And it's really fascinated me. And I started reading about people like Dr. John Dee and Francis mm-hmm. Bacon, and just this always stuck with me. And I just kind of continued researching, and I just began writing and outlining. And um, when I got out of uh, college, it was 1996. I graduated college in 1995, and this was the year... After I got out of college, but before I went to law school, I, I was invited to join a Masonic Lodge here in Baltimore. And I thought, well, this is a perfect time for me. You know, I'm out of college, but I'm not going to law school yet. So I took it and I became a Freemason. Uh, I, I joined in 1996. I was I became a you know, went through the three degrees in 1997. And um, I, it's just something that always interested me. And I just began doing more research and writing. And I, I parlayed this into my first book called The Royal Arch of Enoch. And uh 
you know, after that was published, the, the final chapter of that dealt with Masonic and esoteric symbolism in films. And this was something I wanted to talk about much more. So I parlayed that into my next book, which was Cinema Symbolism. And of course, as I was writing that, uh, there was even more movies I wanted to talk about. So hence, Cinema Symbolism 2 was just released earlier this year. Why is there such an interest, in your opinion, I've got about a minute before I have to go to a commercial break here. Why sure. do you think there's so much interest in in the Freemasons these days? I, th- I think um, a lot of it has to do with it. It's very their, their influence upon society, and especially with the development of the United States, is irrefutable. And it's very interesting. Uh, the, the, the people who founded this country, the founding fathers, really relied on, on masonry and its teachings and its symbols really to cultivate this nation. There's really no other way to explain it. And uh, it, it's fascinating because when you really come to understand the symbolism mm-hmm. in the proper contextual basis, you'll really be able to understand and decode, you know, what's going on with the architecture or the streetscapes, you know, or why this symbol's here and why this is placed here. And it's a really interesting study. And this is really the purview of my first book, uh, which which was like you mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's a 700-page book where I really break down a lot of esoteric Masonic symbolism, you know, and how, how it was really used to invent the United States. Robert, please stand by. You and I have to take our first break. Explanation. Robert Sullivan is our special guest this hour. His website is www.robertwsullivan4, and that's in Roman numerals, Robert W. Sullivan, IV. Dot com, and we'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away, guys. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Robert W. Sullivan is our guest of this hour, Exonation, and uh, Robert... uh, Freemasonry in films, uh, National Treasure. Remember that one? Was that was Nicolas Cage, I believe? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, that's a movie that I talk, talked about in my very first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, and uh, that movie is actually a Masonic ritual. Uh, you are actually literally watching a free Masonic ritual on the big screen when you watch the first National Treasure movie. Just let me explain. Sure, um, please. The, 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 yeah, the ritual. Um, documents. It's part of the the, the, the ritual is called the Royal Arch of Enoch, and it, mm-hmm. it's part of the high degree ceremonials, uh, both in the Scottish Rite and York Rite. And it documents the this, this recovery and restoration of this Masonic treasure in a subterranean vault be- beneath the Holy Ground uh, in Jerusalem. It, it, it's about where the, the building the Second Temple, which is known as the, sec- the, the the Temple of Zorobabel. And as they're building it, they discover this uh, trap door in the ground, and it leads to this subterranean vault which in it is this concealed Masonic treasure. Uh, and, of course, this is exactly the movie. 
the movie is is the location or the discovery of the subterranean vault beneath the holy ground. Uh, they set it in New York City, uh, not in Jerusalem. Uh, that contains all this, uh, you know, wealth of information and Knights Templar treasure and, you know, Masonic treasure. And the placement of the church in New York has to do with uh, a man by the name of DeWitt Clinton, who was the former mayor of New York and uh, former governor of New York State. Uh, he, he is absolutely critical when it comes to the development and furtherance of Freemasonry as a nation building device in the context of the United States. So when you're watching uh, National Treasure, the very first one, the, the second one has some veiled symbolism as well. But the actual first movie is a Masonic ritual on the big screen. Why is Freemasonry considered a secret society? Well, I would say it's 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 probably an inaccurate uh, title. It's a society with secrets. Uh, obviously, if it was a true secret society, we would never hear, have true, heard of yeah. it. Yeah, but um, it, it certainly is is public. Uh, its buildings are marked. Uh, the, the, the lodges have web pages online. You can certainly find the, the grand lodges of all the states. My web, my, my uh, lodge, which is known as Amicable St. John's Lodge Number 25, has a website. You can go check that out. Uh, and uh, it's it, it it is, you know, a, a society. It's a fraternal organization. Mm -hmm. But I believe um, and again, this is the subject matter of my first book, uh, that the, the rituals and its underlying philosophy and its symbolism contains what I would best describe as like sort of hidden truths that isn't it, 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 it's decodable, but it takes years to do. Uh, you know, you really have to, you know, read the works of people like Albert Pike and Manly P. Hall, and, and you really begin to put together what these rituals are all about and its related symbolism. When that's done, and you'll be able to start picking up as how these guys were using it to build, to nation build, especially with the United States. But in the year 2017, are these rituals, are these codes, are these symbols really required? Well, uh, I would say that they're required in the sense of um, when you go through them in the lodge, mm -hmm. it's required because this is how you bond. Uh, you know, this is a, a device to, you know, bond you with your fellow brothers uh, to bring you in to sort of, uh, you know, undergo the ritual process. So, you know, that you've gone, you know, you're, you're going through what everyone in this lodge and all other Freemasons have gone before. So in that context, I think the ritual. I think, I think the symbolism and the rich, and I think it is important because it, 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 they contain underlying truths. And when that's discovered, it's, you know, you, you'll be able to decode uh, this material much more easily. You know, and again, you know, mm -hmm. why, why this monument stands here or why this is like that or why this is, you know, why this symbol appears on a library. Uh, you know, it, it becomes much more easier to decode. And I do think it still has relevance and it's certainly interesting, uh, to say the least. But why isn't well, this information openly shared with members of the public? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I said, why isn't this information then, if it's so important, shared with the public? After well, all, after all, isn't the United States uh, a, a country that you know shares its history with its public? Well, I, th that's part of the problem with it. That's where this whole idea of this grandiose conspiracy uh, mm -hmm. comes from, is there was no transparency with any of this. These guys just worked in secret and they did it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things, if you're interested in Freemasonry, certainly you are free to join it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, you know, a lot of the books about Freemasonry are completely made to the public. Um, you can, you know, pick up these books anywhere. You can certainly pick my book up anywhere um, and, and discover this material for yourself. It's just that the, the rituals and the passwords and the tokens, they try to keep to themselves um, just to make the experience of the person going through, um, you know, more, more important and more relevant, especially in today's age, in, in the Internet age. But, um, you know, the, the material is discernible and uh, it can be discovered by the public. Like I said, I wrote a 700 page book about it that mm -hmm. you can pick up right now. Interesting. What other movies do you think that uh, are coded like a uh, national treasure? Oh, well, there's many of them. Um, there, there, are, there, there are loads of movies out there that, that, that different have that have different uh, codes or underlying themes or you know hidden arcana in them. Uh, it, it depends on for, for when I when I do these uh, dissections, when I do these analysis, the first thing that's critical is kind of discerning what the context of the movie is, or and, and even seeing if there is anything. Uh, some movies you know, are great movies anyway, but really don't have any underlying meaning or hidden symbolism or hidden meanings or anything like that. Uh, but no, a, a lot of movies have, um, you know, different underlying themes. Uh, I mean, Freemasonry aside, uh, you get into movies such as The Shining with St Stanley Kubrick. 
uh, which has loads of uh, repetition in it that is veiled beneath the surface. Um, and he's doing this. The motivation for this is to convey to your both your conscious and your subconscious mind this vicious reincarnation cycle going on inside the Overlook Hotel. Uh, you have uh, movies that have uh, religious doctrines in them, such as the Matrix movies, uh, especially the first Matrix movie. This this is really the Gnostic religion um, on film or Gnostic theology on film. Uh, other Gnostic movies in, would, would include movies like Fight Club, uh, mm -hmm. which which has a lot of hidden religious allegory in it. Uh, same with uh, The Truman Show uh, with Jim Carrey. That That is also a very Gnostic movie. You have movies that incorporate and contain uh, what I would call comparative mythology. This comes out of the world of, a, of an American uh, myth, comparative mythology writer named Joseph Campbell. He wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he gets into comparative mythology. Uh, you, you, will you will find this all over the place when you, when you become familiar with its components in movies such as Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, the Harry Potter films, Chronicle of Narnia. Uh, you will find a Christian allegory. Uh, and, you know, what I call uh, sort of in some instances, what I would call occult Catholic allegory in movies such as the Sergio Leone Spaghetti Westerns. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have some very deep underlying religious um, themes going on in them. You, you will find this exact same undercurrent in the Martin Scorsese film called Gangs in New York. He, he utilizes some of these exact same, you know, religious techniques. So masonry is a very popular subject matter, but. Um, it's not the only one. And it's, uh, you know, lots of different themes and arcana going on in, in movies. And it's really for me when I do this, it's it's deciphering what's the um, you know, what's the proper context. And then the symbolism becomes much more readily to discern. How is the general public? Uh, are, are they catching on or is the symbolism so well hidden that unless you are fully cognizant of what the symbology applies to that it just goes unnoticed and the movie continues yeah I, I, it, it depends on the um, sophistication of the viewer mm -hmm. uh, you know it's, it's a great question you know why, why do this um I, you're dealing with a lot of themes of, of psychology and ancient psychology such as this is what plato called the theory of forms carl gustav Jung called it the collective unconscious where there are these hidden themes and symbols and, and archetypes in our unconscious mind. And when you present them on screen, uh, we become hooked on them. And it's, you know, in a, in a way, if you want to just look at it in the most base form, it's a way for, to generate money. But I, I think for the, the movie producers and the directors, it's really for them a form of art. art. Mm. Uh, what, what I would equate it to is placing things like the golden ratio or the vesica pisces it's sacred art you know like you would find in sacred architecture right. sacred geometry same sort of thing only with film um you know you may you may not be 100 percent cognizant when you walk into one of these gothic cathedrals of what exactly is going on but you know you're going to be blown away by the architecture the flying buttresses the columns uh and it's the same thing with movies it's it's the the movie impresses you it has archetypal imagery in it and um you know, it depends on the sophistication of the viewer. I, I guess for me, it was one of my motivations for to writing these books was uh, to point all this out. But I, it, it definitely seems to be coming more and more well known. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't do it in a proper context. They kind of just throw everything against the wall and hope something sticks or say, oh, every time you see a eye in a triangle or something, this is Illuminati mind control or something like that. That's not that's something I necessarily buy into. Um, but make no mistake, I do believe that this material is being intentionally placed and with great effect and uh, for, for with great with great results by these filmmakers. How would you describe Gnosticism? Well, Gnosticism is an ancient religion um, or ancient theology. Modern day historians uh, date it to around uh, the second or third century. There was no group of people who called themselves Gnostics. Mm -hmm. This was a term later applied to them. Uh, they are often considered, you know, perhaps radical Jews who were tired of, uh, or radical Christians who wanted a more mystical blend of the religion, uh, neo, uh, you know, blends of uh, paganism and Neoplatonism with this. Um, there, are there are different components um, to Gnosticism, but some of the main ones, and the ones you'll find in, the, in film, is the idea of a lesser God, um, is a God of the material world, a manipulative God, who likes to keep mankind subjugated in a, in, a, in, a, in stasis. Um, this is what's known as the Demiurge. Uh, the listeners may be aware of this. He, he often, the Demiurge often associates with the God of the Old Testament, uh, Jehovah. 
uh, and and he he is assisted in running the universe by a series with with, with a group of archangels and demons known as archons, and uh, they help subjugate mankind, mankind and help them keep them in a, in a stasis, asleep. Um, they 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 keep them down basically. They they put them down, um, and. Uh, you know, you, you know, the, the other one of the other main tenets of, of Gnosticism is, is the world we live in is a false reality, um, that there is this greater spirit. We're, we're trapped in a world of materialism uh, and, and, and there's this greater spiritual hierarchy out there, uh, sort of this alien God that is above the demiurge and above the arch- archons that through spiritual exercises we can obtain and sort of bypass the archons and bypass the demiurge. Uh, and and it, it, the, the, what, what I'll just wrap up on is the demiurge and the archon sort of run the universe and then by default the earth imperfectly. Um, it, it's a, sort of a, a train wreck almost. So, so you'll find this in film. I mean, a, a Gnostic film. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think of movies like The Truman Show, um, where you clearly have the guy living in the false reality, yeah. the false construct. Um, you have the Ed Harris character who is clearly the demiurge who's pulling the strings, the master of the material world. And, of course, Truman wants, wants out of this. Uh, you know, he he's the true man. He wants spiritual gnosis. So, you know, you'll have uh, some 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 great Gnostic and religious symbolism going on inside uh, the Truman Show. Same thing with the Matrix movie. Um, you, you know, the agents would be the archons, the false reality that Neo knows is no good uh, and, and is trying to escape from. So Gnosticism uh, turns up uh, in cinema uh, quite often. Uh, it's it's a real popular theme theme uh, in Hollywood. It's something I talk about actually in both my books, and in fact, it's it's so popular that uh, well, I'm actually outlining cinema symbolism three as we speak, and I'm going to do a whole chapter called uh, you know Gnostic cinema, where I'm going to take on some movies that I, I haven't done before, such as like Snow Piercer, Dark City, things like that. All right, stand by. We've got to take our break for the news at the bottom of the hour. Exxon Nation, Robert Sullivan is our special guest. His website is Robert Robert W. Sullivan, and then the Roman numerals for four, which are IV. So you've got Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com, and we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada www.xzbn.net for all of the great programming available to you, 724-365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Robert W. Sullivan is our special guest this hour. www.robertwsullivaniv, as in the number four, Robert Sullivan, Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com. Um, tell me about the Crimson Peak as a grand homage to Kubrick's The Shining. Well, right. Um, that's that's really interesting. Um, the the movie uh, plays out. Um, when you watch the crim- when you watch Crimson Peak, um, you will uh, see a lot of symbolism going on with the costuming, and there's a lot of play on light and darkness um, with the first half of the movie and the second half. And I was sitting there watching it, and um, it, it's really uh, fascinating because I was watching about halfway through it. You'll come to the scene where the Mia Wasikowska character um, goes into um, a uh, bathroom Mm -hmm. and a ghost comes up um in this green bathroom and of course the um first thing that you're going to um see is you know 
you're going to come to this idea that, hey, this reminds me of something. And it does. It reminds you of the scene in The Shining where Jack Torrance goes into the, um, see, you know, the bathroom 237 with the ghost coming up out of the shower and scares him off. And I remember sitting there watching. I thought the scenes just really looked um, so similar. And, um, you know, I'm watching. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, what's going on here? Is he just paying homage to The Shining or is he trying to tell me something? And I actually was watching this for the very first time. I was watching on Blu-ray. And um, when I was doing this, I actually paused the, um, the movie and I went back. And I put my notes aside and I thought to myself, well, let me, um, you know, take a look at this and, uh, you know, start over, as it were, mm -hmm. and see if there's, uh, you know, anything going on in this movie that also reminds me of The Shining. Well, sure enough, I start watching this again. And there are just these unbelievable comparisons between The Shining and Crimson Peak. I could go into a little bit of them if you uh, like. Sure, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this off here. Um, okay. This is not memorized, and you're going to see why. So I'm going to start with Crimson Peak, and then I'm going to go to The Shining. And like I said, this was triggered by the scene in Crimson Peak where mm -hmm. she goes into this green bathroom, sees the ghost come up, scares her off. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've seen this before. Jack Torrance goes into the green bathroom. The evil female ghost comes up, scare him off. So Crimson Peak, we have. Uh, a struggling writer, Edith Cushing, goes to an isolated haunted mansion with two people, Sir Thomas and Lady Lucille Sharp. Ghosts aside, they are the only three inhabitants of the mansion during the film. Then we go to The Shining. A struggling writer, Jack Torrance, goes to an isolated hotel with two people, Wendy and Danny Torrance. Ghosts aside, they are the only three inhabitants of the hotel during the film. The name Edith Cushing has 12 letters. The name Jack Torrance has 12 letters. Mia Wasikowska portrays Edith Cushing. The name Mia Wasikowska has 13 letters. Jack Nicholson plays Jack Torrance. The name Jack Nicholson has 13 letters. While uh, sitting in Ogilvy's office, Edith tries to persuade him to publish her manuscript. While sitting in Allman's office, Jack tries to persuade him to hire him as the winter caretaker. Gruesome murders have occurred inside Allerdale Hall. Ghastly murders have occurred inside the Overlook Hotel. Edith Cushing is tormented by ghosts. Jack Torrance is tormented by ghosts. Hmm. Edith Cushing's wardrobe consists of golden yellow frocks and dresses. Jack Torrance drives a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. The estate's name, Allerdale Hall, has 13 letters. The resort's name, Overlook Hotel, has 13 letters. Allardale, Allardale Hall sits on a mountain in Cumberland, England, England. Excuse me. The Overlook Hotel sits on a mountain in Colorado, United States. I'll just do two more of these. Sure. Edith Cushing attends a party with a wealthy aloof with wealthy, aloof American elites, most of whom are superficial. Jack Torrance attends a party with wealthy, aloof American elites who happen to be ghosts. Edith Cushion is warned by the ghost of her dead mother to beware of Crimson Peak. Danny Torrance is warned by the ghost of his, uh, by his imaginary friend, Tony, to beware of the Overlook Hotel. Uh, Edith Cushing conspicuously uses a typewriter. Jack Torrance conspicuously <laughs> uses a typewriter. Inside an opulent men's bathroom, Carter Cushing solicits the truth about Sir Thomas and Lady Lucille from Mr. Holly. Inside an opulent men's bathroom, Jack Torrance solicits the truth about the Overlook Hotel and his son's extrasensory perception from Mr. Grady. The name Holly has five letters. The name Grady has five letters. Um, there's about another 60 of these I could get My into. My goodness. Which it, it's, it's the same movie. I'm, not, I'm just going to cut it off right there. But um, it's a fascinating study i delve into this much more in cinema symbolism too this whole comparative cinema between crimson peak and the shining it's it's fascinating but if, if these were both done by the same director right no these were done by different directors ah. uh, shining was directed in well the shining came out in 1980 and was directed by stanley kubrick mm -hmm. uh, crimson peak i think came out in 2015 it was directed by guillermo, guillermo de toro is it is it possible that the director of, uh, you know, who watched the, the Shining, saw the potential in certain shots and uh, the different effects and, and decided to mimic them in his own movie? Oh, sure. Uh, you, you can definitely say that, um, you know, a, a esoteric homage. Yeah. I mean, this is a whole this is a whole nother study is, you know, you have cinema symbolism, these mm -hmm. movie symbols drawing on ancient religions, ancient archetypes, right. alchemy, occult. They also draw on other movies. Um, mm -hmm. No question about it. I mean, you know, an, another example of this would be, um, you know, you look at the Matrix movie, um, the 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 third one where the Keanu Reeves character Neo finally makes it to the machine city and is standing before the, sort of the machine god 
Deus Ex Machina into the giant evil face. Um, that that is completely coming out of the Wizard of Oz, um, where they're standing before yeah. the, green, the green evil face, uh, which is the wizard, the mm-hmm. all knowing wizard. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is there is that is also part of this is where movies draw upon other movies um, to convey esoteric imagery. I do not dispute that. Okay, this one I have to ask you about because. Mm-hmm. My kids and my grandchildren just loved this movie, The Lion King. Oh, right. That, that's a great one when it comes to comparative religion. Uh, that was the uh, second highest grossing movie of 1994. You have a lot of um, inter- interplay with this with mm-hmm. the ancient religion of Egypt. I mean, the movie set in Africa. Uh, you, you have also some references to Hamlet in this. Um, so it's a retelling of the Egyptian Osirian solar cycle. Uh, and, and you'll find some references to Shakespeare's Hamlet in this. Of course, you have the whole idea of Mustafa um, being, you know, the, the, the king of yep. the pride lands. Um, the, the, the lion associates with the sun. Um, this is because of the house of Leo, uh, the lion um, that's ruled by the sun. That's the sign we are actually in right now. Um, and so the, 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 the lion always identifies with the sun. Think of um, the Chronicle of Narnia, you know, with Aslan, he comes mm-hmm. back and winter's defeated. The winter queen is defeated. It's light versus darkness. It's what, what I would call neo manichaeanism So anyway, we have back to the Lion King. We have um, Mustafa and then we have his solar heir. This would be Horus. This is, of course, Simba. Um, and then you have the evil set. Uh, Typhon, evil brother character. This is Scar. Of course, this is the Egyptian religion. You know, Set conspires to murder um, Osiris and take over. And of course, this is what happens in the movie. And then um, Simba flees and um, uh, Set takes over. And this would be Scar. And of course, the sun is gone. So what happens to the Pride Lands? They turn to waste. Um, it's winter time. allegorically. Um, the land's in a total state of decay. Um, they play on this solar allegory very adroitly. If you pay attention to it, um, when, when Mustafa and Simba are, t- are talking at some point earlier in the movie, um, they talk about the elephant graveyard. Well, if you know about the movement of the sun, the sun rises in the east, it's at midday in the south, and it sets in the west. Um, these are the three stations of the sun. The sun never resides in the north. And, of course, Simba's talking to him about the elephant graveyard. He says, oh, we, we never go over there. We can never go into that. And he said, that sits in the north. He said, that's the northern area. We're, we're forbidden there. Um, so you have this solar allegory going on. And then, of course, Horus defeats Set. And this is exactly what happens. Simba comes back um, and defeats Scar. And, uh, you know, you have the whole idea with this, again, being Hamlet, where the Scar character would be the evil Uncle Claudius. Um, the, the, you know, he's avenging the dead father. Um, and of course, the the two the two animals, uh, I think it's Pumbaa and, and Timber, I believe their names were the ones who sing Hakuna Matata. This would be the Horatio character uh, from uh, they, they would equate to the Horatio character from Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, yeah, a lot of great solar allegory going on um, inside the Lion King, uh, a lot of Egyptian comparative religion going on. And, uh, you know, you get you get these two mixed together with with uh, ancient religion and Hamlet. It's no wonder this movie made as much money as it did. Unreal. Um, I also want to talk to you about the esoteric casting of Max von Sydow in Star Wars. This is this is really fascinating, and and this is really an interesting study. And this was some, this is something that I thought originally was somewhat scarce. I'm now learning that this is much more prevalent than I had originally anticipated. And and what this is, Rob, is. Uh, we talk about using ancient symbols, archetypes, themes in movies yeah. to, to, to persuade you or to affect you. We talk about we just talked about how they even rely on other movies um, to persuade, you know, to, to draw on movie of mm-hmm. other movies for this powerful imagery. This is fascinating because this is where they actually place an actor in a movie for occult purposes to bring to, to conjure these earlier valances, these cultural valances that these actors may bring to a particular role. So Boncito is a great one. I first noticed this with the second Matrix movie. Um, the Anthony Zerbe character in that is placed in there for these same sort of purposes. I won't get into that one right now. Boncito in in uh, Star Wars um, I was watching. I, I like the movie. I liked episode seven. I'm watching it a lot. I have it on Blu-ray here and I'm watching it. It's, it's striking to me. I'm thinking, why is Von Cito in this movie? You know, he's only in it for the beginning of the movie. You know, I don't understand this. They could put anybody in here to do the same thing. I'm mm-hmm. watching. I'm watching. And finally, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized, well, his, this casting is intentional. What 
you, what the filmmakers have done, and this is really a, 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 a form of sorcery, by placing Von Cito in that movie, they're actually conjuring two other movies um, from Cito, Von Cito's career. So you watch the beginning of Star Wars Episode Seven. you got it on the desert planet, while Von Cito's this hermit character, and he comes out and confronts the dark evil lord. He's eventually struck down. Um, you know, where have I seen this before? Well, I mean, it's the beginning of The Exorcist, where Von Cito is the hermit figure, the Jesuit priest, he's in the desert and it's the very beginning of the movie and he comes out and confronts the dark evil Lord, the statue of Pazuzu, the devil. Um, and then of course, later on in the movie he gets killed, but it's, it's conjuring in your subconscious mind that um, imagery from the exorcist. Then I'm sitting, sitting, thinking to myself, I said, well, I've seen this also somewhere else. And it's another Von Cito movie. It's Dune, uh, where Von Cito again is the hermit figure and he's on the desert planet and he's confronted by once again, the dark evil Lord Baron Harkonnen and gets killed, gets struck down. So why do this? What the filmmakers are doing and wreaking havoc with, with your subconscious mind is by casting Von Cito in that minor bit in that movie at the very beginning, they are subconsciously drawing on these cultural valances that Von Cito brings to this particular picture. And by doing so, they are investing this imagery of the First Order in Star Wars, equating them to the demonism of Pazuzu and the savagery of the Harkonnens. And that, that is real cinema sorcery. Um, and there are other movies that are doing this. I thought this was extremely scarce when I first started noticing this. But I, I have documented other instances where the directors and producers will employ actors and actresses to convey occult purposes to invest their newer movie with these earlier versions. And it's a really interesting study. How legal is this? Oh, I don't think it's illegal at all. Um, I, I, th I, I don't think uh, there's any, I'm a lawyer. I don't, I wouldn't mm -hmm. think there's any legal consequence to any of this. What, what differentiates from what we're talking about with that, the film producers are doing using Gnosticism symbols, um, you know, members of the occult to play parts and, and mind control. Well, I, I mean, I would say, well, you have to be careful with mind control because, you know, you're kind of on a slippery slope with this. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to, you know, call it mind control because I mean, I, you, you could say it's trying to influence you, but I mean, I, I don't know if I'd say they're trying to control you to do any specific thing or act out or anything like that. Um, I mean, you know, is it mind control? I mean, I don't know. Is it when you walk onto a college campus as a freshman and there's all these fraternity houses barking you, hey, come mm -hmm. to this party and, you know, trying to get you to join? I mean, I don't know. Is that mind control? Or are they just trying to persuade you? Um, I think I think with a lot of film producers, I mean, I can't say this for certain, but what I what I believe and what I've discovered in doing this research is I, they, they see their films as artwork. Uh, much akin to like Da Vinci's Last Supper. And by using this imagery and using this occultism and these symbols. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Welcome back, everyone. My guest this hour is Robert W. Sullivan, 
and I've been having a, a great hour with him. And Robert, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a great pleasure having you with us. Oh, well, thank you, Rob, for having me on the X Zone. The pleasure was all mine. I thought it was, I think it's a great show. Thank, thank you. you again for having me on. Much right. appreciated. Well, this won't be the first end. It won't be the last time. Um, R- Robert, do you remember years ago when there was all this kerfuffle about subliminal av- advertising? Vaguely, uh, subliminal advertising has been going on mm-hmm. for years. Um, I'm a little familiar with it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the yeah. doctrine of it. I'm just wondering what the similarities are to what movie the movie uh, director or the the writers or the producers are putting into the movies that is okay for them to do that, and yet subliminal advertising was outlawed. Yeah, well, a lot of times with with um, with with. Uh, uh, with movies, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you have things like product placement. I don't get involved with that. That's yeah. where a, you know, where they pay money to put a can of Coke, Coke there or something like that. Um, the imagery isn't that's used in, in these movies. I don't believe is, 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 um, it's, it's really not advertising anything. Okay. It's just drawing on, you know, ancient religions. I, I don't see it as insidious or mind control or anything like that. I just see it as no different than Da Vinci using sacred geometry in one of his paintings. Um, that's sort of my interpretation of it. And okay. you know, like I said, I don't think there's any sort sure. of illegality um, going on here. What was your impression of the Da Vinci Code? Uh, I never read the book. I like the, I, th- I thought the movie was okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie, it's interesting. That's actually a movie I took on in my, in my first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch. Uh, we talked about the National Treasure movie. Uh, the, there's similar parallel imagery going on in the, in the Da Vinci Code as well. Um, it, it's a long story, but um you know, again, there's something I took on in the first book, but there's actually hidden um, symbols and, and numbers in that movie that are is quite astounding that p- runs parallel with National Treasure. And it actually ties into this uh, this Royal Arch of Enoch, uh, you know, treasure vault yeah. um, gaining of wisdom. Uh, it's a long story, but there is hidden symbolism in that as well. The uh, Gnostic Overtomes in 1979's The Warriors. Tell us about that. Yeah, this this is a great movie, and I, I, it's one of my all time favorites. And this is a movie that I wouldn't go. So, I, I'm got to tread carefully here a little bit. I wouldn't go so far as to call this a gnostic film, mm-hmm. but it definitely flirts with it. And I, I just like this whole idea of the the whole idea of the journey of the self. I mean, this is you know it, one of the tenets of gnosticism is divine spark ignition, expansion of consciousness, and, and this is sort of what you have going on in in the mate in, in the warriors. You have them, the group, on this nocturnal journey, uh, you know, sort of battling themselves. These other gangs are sort of reflections of them. Uh, it's 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 they're gaining wisdom along the way. They're trapped in materialism, I and mean, that's all they care about is their turf. Uh, you have um, the introduction of the sacred feminine. This would be in, in Gnosticism, the Sophia character. Right. Um, you know, she they're, they're the warriors. Her name is Mercy. So that's the polar opposite of, of warriors. She's benevolence and mercy. Um, so you have an uh, idea of dualism there. Uh, you have um, them battling back. And then I like it at the very end where they're, where they're standing in front of, uh, you know, they finally make it back to Coney Island mm-hmm. and they're standing, you know, looking over the, uh, over the neighborhood. And it's just this dilapidated hellhole. And it's, this is what they've been fighting with. This is the reality. And the sun's rising, you know, bringing light, wisdom. And, and Swan, who's the leader of the gang, says, you know, is this what we fought all night to get back to? And he has this Gnostic epiphany and he realizes that the, you know, the material reality that he's in, this gang banging is leading him nowhere. And they walk away from it at the end. They, they actually turn and walk away from it. They have this Gnostic revelation and they turn and walk away with it or walk away from it. I like it. I mean, this is really interesting. Also, um, this, the, the, the leader of the gang is known as Swan. And uh, you, you'll hear him call that throughout the whole movie, Swan. Uh, and if you're familiar with ancient symbolism, a, a swan is actually a symbol of someone initiated into the mystery tradition, um, someone who's initiated to gain gnosis. And this is, of course, exactly what the character <laughs> undergoes through the film. So there are these very deep, complex Gnostic um, undercurrents in the Warriors. It's a fantastic movie. It's a great movie. If you, if you have never seen it, check it out. But when you check it out, try to pay attention to this. What is the what are negative theology and Sethian Gnosticism? Right, um, this is something going on in uh, the Lost Highway movie by David Lynch. 
um, they, they, they preached native theology is something that was preached by a group of Gnostics known as the Sethians. Um, and this is a, a very ancient religion, and this is something you'll find in Lost Highway. I have a whole chapter on David Lynch, and I should just point out that he is by far and away one of the most difficult film directors to pick apart and dissect. Hmm. His movies are incredibly complex. Uh, they are very overlayered with symbolism. Uh, and, and it was by far and away the most difficult chapter to write in the book. Uh, and what, what, what negative theology is, is this notion that uh, it, the, 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 the farther or the, the more negative I am um, and the more I am unlike God, the closer to God I become. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of reversed theology where Christianity is you have to be, be like God and be a nice person to achieve the Godhead. Mm -hmm. Negative theology is the opposite. The more harm I do and the more vicious I am, the actual closer to God I become. Um, this was codified, this theology, this was practiced by this group called the Sethians. Um, this was codified in the 5th century by a writer who called himself Dionysus the pseudo Arapagit, And this was um, Christianized in the Middle Ages by a saint named Thomas Aquinas. In Lost Highway, you will find this exact theme going on where the Bill Pullman, Fred Madison character is a jerk. He's controlling. Um, he, 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 he is a, a control freak. He beats up his wife. He eventually kills his wife. Um, and then um, he goes to jail. And in this sort of limbo, um, does he, is he become liberated? Does he become another person? He becomes a, an entirely different person known as Pete Dayton. And he walks out of jail and becomes this wonderful person. Um, this is negative theology. This is Sethian Gnosticism. And uh, it, it's a Lost Highway by Lynch is a very complex movie. By far and away, it's, it's not, almost impossible to dissect it, it with, with 100 percent certainty. But uh, if, if you're interested in negative theology and Sethian Gnosticism, check out Lynch's Lost Highway. Again, I have to ask you, why is this type of movie so popular? Well, I, I, I think that these movies are popular um, because, you know, it, it's one of these things. What comes first? I mean, there are many movies out there that are popular that do not incorporate any esoteric imagery whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the movies like, like like a movie like Quentin Tarantino, like Reservoir Dogs. I mean, it's a great movie. Yeah, it has a couple archetypes in it, but nothing, nothing esoteric about it whatsoever. Um, Lynch loves to employ Gnostic themes, occult themes in his movies. I took on four of his movies in my book, In Cinema Symbolism 2. Mm -hmm. I took on Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, and Dune. Um, and, and, and these movies, all these movies are rich in occult and esoteric symbolism. And uh, again, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's these guys painting these perfect pictures. And it, it helps transform their celluloid uh, into esoteric masterpieces. But, you know, when you look at the type of programming that, that, that so many people are watching today, the, the Walking Dead, vampires, zombies, how do, how do you explain this as somebody who is a connoisseur of the, of the movies? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part. How do I, oh, how do I explain it? Yeah. Well, I wrote, I wrote two books about it, um, and certainly a person can, can read the book, um, and I try to lay it out. I, I try to always, in my books, give background information. I just don't delve, delve headfirst in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to make sure that the reader has... So if I'm talking about a Gnostic film, for instance, I mean, I want to give the tenets of Gnosticism so they know um, what, what it is they're looking for. Um, this is something I took on with, you know, you mentioned vampires. Yes. Um, this is something I took on with the... I, I have a whole section on vampire movies. Um, in, in, in the movie, the, in the first movie book, um, the Bram Stoker novel Dracula is, is a reference to, um, uh, Madame Blavatsky's theosophy movement and in, in invading Victorian England. Um, and that's what Dracula is representing. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I, I have to, I, you know, whenever I'm explaining this, I always try to give the background information mm -hmm. uh, so that the person can then go forward and then it makes it more identifiable for when they watch the movie. I mean, I, I want to just break down a movie and say, oh, this is this, this is right. this, this is that. I always give the background information, um, you know, the outline of, hey, you know, this is this, here, here's what this is based upon, here's the Osirian cycle, here's what this teaches, oh, and, and now, you know, now I'll punch in, you know, here, here it is applied to The Lion King or The Chronicles of Narnia or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time understanding why anybody would want to watch a movie about vampires or a movie about The Walking Dead. Is it the, is it the fright factor? 
Well, I mean, that's sort of a question of taste. I mean, I can't answer, you know, why someone, I mean, I, I happen to like some of the vampire movies mm-hmm. and, the, and the Dracula films. I think some of them are very well done. Um, I like monster movies. I, I grew up watching the universal horror films. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I know some people, um, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly, I mean, my father, for instance, loves the movie Blade Runner. Um, absolutely loves it and hates the Matrix. Um, so some people, you know, you know, some of it's just a question of taste, I suppose. But I guess just to wrap up, you know, whenever I'm doing one of these movies or I'm breaking it down, I always try to give the background. Inform- I always do give the background information so the reader's cognizant of the outline of what this is based upon. Robert, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us tonight here on the X Zone. I wish you much success. Let our listeners know how they can find out more about you and where they can get copies of your book. Well, Books, thank you, Rob, for having me. Yeah, for having me on the X Zone tonight. My pleasure. It was greatly appreciated. I thought the show was fantastic. Thank uh, you, sir. My name is Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth. Uh, the easiest way to find me is just my website, which you've been giving out. It's www.robertwsullivaniv.com for the fourth. Um, there are links there to purchase my books. They're available on all major online retailers such as Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. You can get the print edition. You can get the Kindle, the eBooks, all readily available. There's um, links to my social media. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, links to buy the book, uh, links to my YouTube channel, um, information about me, information about upcoming events and appearances and shows that I'm going to be on. Just go there. It's very easy to navigate. www.robertwsullivaniv.com. Robert, take care of yourself. Great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Exxon Nation will be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> 